What's up, Navigating Academia family? This is your buddy, Dr. Jay Phoenixing, coming at you to be able to discuss a question that if you're applying to a clinical psychology PhD program, you are probably wondering right now. Today is August 12th when I'm recording this. What can you do right now before the semester starts to be able to max out your chances of getting into one of these competitive programs? Let's talk about it today. So before we get started today, please do take a second to be able to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and hit that bell so you get notifications every time we post new original content. By the way, if you need help with any of the things that we're going to be talking about today, from preparing the CV, to writing a personal statement, to anything in between, identifying programs and target supervisors and so forth, go ahead and book a session with me down below. And let's go ahead and talk about how we can max out those chances and get all of your materials in the right form so that we can get you into your target program. So let's go ahead and get right into the content for today. So the first thing that you want to do, I just mentioned, which is to be able to optimize your CV. There are very specific uh, categories in your CV that you should have everything. And it doesn't have to be in this order, but I do recommend it, right? So things such as education, so in terms of your educational background, what was your most recent degree, and maybe you already have a master's degree, maybe even actually already have a doctoral degree, right? Uh, but at least your undergraduate degree. What was your major? Who was your supervisor? What was your cumulative GPA and your major GPA, provided that your major GPA was in the field of behavioral health, psychology, social work, counseling, nursing, and so forth, okay? Now, uh, you also want to have the dates that you actually completed those degrees and so forth. Now, if you're applying to more of a research-based program, then I want you to make sure that, that those are the categories that you have next. So research experience and then underneath detail all of the major research experiences you have. No, it does not count if you did a project in your research methods class or your experimental you know, methods class those do not count. I'm talking about research assistantships, research internships. That's what we're going to put in there. We're going to put in a healthy amount of detail there in terms of your responsibilities in each one of those different positions. Now, again, if it's a more research-focused programs, then we want to talk about conference presentations. Posters count, papers count. Posters count and papers count, but they don't really count if it's at like a university, uh, you know, program or like a departmental program that's put on like a symposium or like, a, you know, a conference that's only at your university. If that's all you have, put it there. But if you have other things that you've done, for example, maybe you presented at uh, a regional conference, you presented at a national conference, okay, or an international conference, those are going to be much better suited to creating the perception uh, that you really want to be part of this field, okay? So, uh, poster and paper presentations under a conference presentation tag, and then after that, we want to talk about um, your publication record. And we're talking about publications in peer-reviewed academic journals or edited books. No, it doesn't count if you did an op-ed or if you wrote something in a newspaper at the university. I think that's awesome and really great practice. But here, we're talking about peer-reviewed publications specifically within the field of academia. Okay, now let's say that this is not a research-based program, it's a clinical program, fabulous. Then we would want to put clinical experience above all those research categories that I just mentioned. If it is a research-based program, you put clinical experience next, okay? And keep in mind that if you had a volunteer position, but it involved working with particularly vulnerable populations, for example, individuals um, who are homeless or individuals who, um, and even the word homeless, people don't like these days. Um, but uh, homeless are individuals who uh, are housed at juvenile detention centers. Again, a lot of people don't like the term juvenile detention anymore, right? Uh, but whatever it happens to be, if you're working with vulnerable populations and it was a volunteer experience, you still want to put that under clinical experience, okay? So that's a big one, okay? Clinical experience. Again, detail what were your main responsibilities, but keep them all uh, really focused on your... Uh, uh, on your roles that were actually interacting with other individuals. So if it was something like, you know, learning to use Microsoft, you know, PowerPoint or something like that, this is not going to help you, right? Uh, by the way, a lot of people at the very end uh, of, their, um, uh, of their CV, 
they end up putting something there like a skill sets category. I do not recommend putting a skill sets category uh, at the end. Usually people put things in there that are not helpful. So things like, you know, no, using SPSS, which is insanely basic for graduate school, right? I wouldn't recommend putting that in there. Um, maybe you learn to use Python and you're using it um, for some of your research. Amazing. Put that in the research section, right? Do not put that in a skill set category. Right? Same thing, it's really cool if you speak multiple languages, that's not going to help you get into graduate school. So it's not really necessary to be able to put those things there. If you want to, though, talk about it, that's something that maybe you want to talk about in the interview if you're lucky enough to give an interview, okay? But it's not necessary to put in your CV, right? In any case, then we want to have a section about awards and grants, okay? So what did you get in terms of awards and grants, if any, at the undergraduate level? Those will help you quite a bit. After that, we want to have professional memberships. Uh, if you do not have any professional memberships, Memberships. Um, now, obviously, as an undergraduate, let's say you're in the U.S., you want something like Psychi, or you know, maybe your university has a psychological society. My undergrad did. Um, if you're a that's okay. And hopefully, you've run for something, so maybe you have some leadership positions there. I do not recommend having a separate section that's called leadership positions or leadership experience or anything like that. I just don't recommend that. I think it's unnecessary. You can include those experiences elsewhere. Okay, uh, and then after that, this is where you would have something if you wanted to, like skill sets. There's no need to put anything in there about references and this kind of stuff. That's more for a resume than a CV. Okay, so that is the general order and the kind of content that you need. Uh, formatting of the CV is incredibly important. Uh, don't let anybody tell you that it's not. So make sure that you have other people take a look at it. Yes, it's fine to be able to have friends and family look at it. Yes, it's fine for people at, let's say, career services, for example, look at it. I do recommend that you have an independent party who really knows what they're doing, look at it as well, to be able to read through it and polish it up for you, right? Again, it could be me, it could be really anybody who's an external consultant. I do really recommend that, it's totally worth it, okay? So, that's the CV, okay? Next thing is that I want you to get your transcripts in order, okay? Like, get copies of them. These are little practical things that you probably have more time now than you will when the forthcoming semester starts, so just kind of get copies of those. Okay, so get those transcripts. Uh, take the GRE if you need to take the GRE or take any kind of standardized exam in your country that you may need to take. Now, it's possible that all the programs that you're applying for don't require the GRE, right? Maybe you've even selected programs based on where you don't have to take the GRE. That's fine, right, if that's what you want to do. But I will say one thing about that which is that if your GR, sorry, if your GPA, let's say your grade, grade point average, right, is particularly low, and for a lot of these programs, when I say particularly low, right, we're talking about like a 3.5 or below, right? And remember, the only thing that matters is for your target programs, look up the median, not the average, the median GPA for the last several incoming classes, the last several incoming cohorts, and if you can get that or above, you're fine. If it's below that, though, and that may be below 3.5, it's fine. But if it's below that, your GPA is below that uh, standard, that threshold, then taking the GRE is really worthwhile. Okay, so I really do recommend that in those cases because it's something that's going to make you stand out. Especially if the program doesn't require it, then you're really going to stand out if you kick butt. And if you don't kick butt, you don't have to submit it. Right? Pretty good. And remember, if you need a custom study plan for the GRE, we can talk about it in a session. But otherwise, watch all the videos at least, please on this channel on Navigating Academia about how to be able to max out your GRE score and main mistakes to avoid, okay? That's the GRE. The next thing is to be able to get in touch with your letter of recommendation writers. Now remember, I always recommend getting at least three letters, one person who knows you academically, one person who knows you in terms of practical experience, and one person who knows you in terms of research experience, okay? Now, let's say that the program you're applying to, again, is not a particularly research-oriented degree. This happens sometimes for some programs, right? And that's fine. Now, if that's the case, right, maybe you don't need a research uh, uh, a research uh, letter writer, or maybe it's like a pure research degree. It happens rarely, but sometimes <clears throat> in terms of the one that you're applying to then maybe there's no need to be able to have a, some sort of a practical, a clinical letter writer. If that happens, maybe you don't need that person. But in general, I do recommend that triangular strategy. If you don't need a research or practical person, your third letter writer should write about your character, your personality, okay? <clears throat> Whoever you think you want to write your letters, though, you should get in touch with them now. I'm serious. It's August 12th. By the end of August, I want you to do it, okay? Uh, and the reason that I want you to do it so quickly, right, uh, is because those individuals are likely going to get a million requests 
right, to be able to write letters. And the sooner you get in touch with them, the better. Definitely watch some of the other videos here on the channel about how to be able to, like what to tell the letter writers, right, because you need to give them really specific instructions about what you want them to write and come up with a series of bullet points that I call greatest hits. If you need help in that, let me know. Uh, and we need to develop those, right, so that this way the letter writers can put into your letters of recommendation some really specific information on, again, either your academic background, your practical background, or your research background, okay? And these experiences you've amassed over the last several years, okay? Uh, the next thing is to be able to look up past year's application essays if you can get your hands on them for that program. Certain programs you may think, eh, you know what, they're, they're probably going to have very similar, you know, things that you need to write. Guys, I've been doing consultation now for four years in terms of helping people get into grad school and helping them, you know, prepare their materials. I can tell you guys the number of different prompts that I've seen. There's certain things in common, but they can be vastly different. And also, there's some crazy programs. Like there was one I helped somebody apply for last year, nine essays. That was insane right? That happens sometimes though, and it's better that you know what you're getting yourself into instead of blindly going into it, finding your, you know, target three to five programs, up to seven, remember that's what I recommend, um, and then for you to be able to just be totally caught off guard and be like, oh my gosh, how is this possible, right? That there are just so many essays that you need to prepare, okay? Uh, the next thing is to crunch the numbers. This is not sexy, it is not fun, but you need to figure out financially how you're going to make this work. Now, Maybe you're very blessed, right? And maybe you're, yourself or your family has money and they can help to be able to cash flow the tuition or maybe you're getting a waiver of some sort uh, from the university in terms of at least a partial, if not a complete uh, waiver of tuition. Amazing. But keep in mind that even if you get tuition waived, there's still kind of your life that you need to live. You need to pay rent. You need to eat some food. You know, if nothing else, you need to get a subscription to Netflix or whatever you happen to enjoy, all right? Uh, life is going to be really busy during this graduate degree, but it's really important that you take the time to be able to work out financially. How is it you're going to make this work? It is not a good plan for you to be able to go into anything without doing a like anything like this, especially if you're going to into debt to be able to get the degree without really doing essentially like a formal audit of your life in terms of how you're going to make it work uh, either during the degree or afterwards, okay? And again, there's a bunch of videos on the channel that can help you with that. Um, the next thing to be able to do, if you haven't already, and at this time, if, if you're only doing this now, I, I mean, my job is to be really honest with you, you were insanely far behind, okay, if you have not identified your target programs yet. Uh, and at those programs, especially if you know it involves any kind of research, to be able to identify a target supervisor and contact them. You, usually, I recommend at least two years of relationship building with the target supervisor. Um, that sounds insane, but the thing is, these days, you really need to stand out, so more and more people are doing that. So, like I said, you're behind if that's the case, and we need to get you on track. Um, building personal connections with a supervisor is not you sending them an email. Okay, now, should you send them an email to let them know that you're interested in working with them? Of course you should, right? Uh, and I've got a number of templates that I can always show you guys uh, in terms of that. Uh, but the key thing is that you need to ideally see them in person at a conference, go to the university, right, to be able to visit, whatever it happens to be, right, but you're really behind at this stage, um, so you need to build that up. Uh, and last but not least, in terms of things you can do right now, is to literally just take like an hour and take a look at the catalog of the you know, hundreds of videos we have here on Navigating Academia, and pick out the ones that have to do with anything that you're really concerned about right now, okay? Uh, and just watch them, and ask questions beneath those uh, those videos, okay? Uh, and if it's a high sensitivity question that's of sufficient interest uh, to other individuals, 15,000 people who are current subscribers, then we can talk about that. And I would love to be able to answer your question. So thank you guys so much. I love you. I appreciate you. And I will see you in the next one. Peace.